Okay, um, so we've got a panel discussion that's coming up now. I'm gonna bring out a couple chairs. Um, Alex, if you wanna uh, pull together your speakers, uh, we'll get set up here with uh, the chairs. I think we got six chairs. Good afternoon, my name is Alex Hill. I'm with CN2 Technology, and I'd like to welcome you to the, the final panel of today's AWARE sessions. So as you probably know by now, uh, AWARE is the AR for Enter Enterprise Alliance. And the goal of the organization is to foster the adoption of augmented reality, especially in the enterprise. So it wants to do this by promoting standards and open and interoperable standards. There are 16 founding members and Many of them are represented here on the panel today. So the other sessions have discussed many practical issues about how to choose use cases, how to uh, fashion data, and uh, dealing with safety, which we just saw. So now we're moving on to talking about how are we going to expand the adoption of AR going forward. So our panelists today are Paul Davies with Boeing, Mustafa uh, Akbari from BitStar, we have Fridolin Wild from uh, the Open University, we have Joe Metzger from Johnson & Johnson, we have Jurgen Lumera from Bosch, and we have Jay Kim from Apex Labs. Uh, you guys need to switch positions. <laughs> I have everything planned based on that. So um, there, are, there are any number of different application areas where uh, AR could potentially find some success. And this group here is a group of people that have practical experience implementing augmented reality in the enterprise. What is the enterprise? The enterprise is is well-formed environments, manufacturing, companies, distribution, et cetera, that can, can see the introduction of this type of technology and benefit from it. So AR is, as we know, not just three, 3D graphics. And I think that the panelists here will, will certainly prove that to you. AR is much more than that. It is a it's a nice catchy term. We used to talk about it for a long time about what does AR mean. I think now we all know it's just a nice sexy term that gets everyone in the door, but it means a lot more than that. But AR does mean context. It means the connection between the physical and digital information. So um, we have practical AR experience and I'd like to get each of the panelists to introduce themselves and describe some of the places that they're finding success now. And I'll start with you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, for anyone that missed my short talk earlier, I'm Paul Davies. I'm out of Boeing's Research and Technology Group. Uh, my team has been um, working in, uh, a with AR to deliver technical data to um, uh, mechanics and technicians on the shop floor. So some of our areas we've been working with, uh, some of our um, production programs, the new um, KC-46 tanker, for instance, we've been um, putting this technology on the shop floor there and we've had pretty good success there. Um, more recently in El Segundo and our satellite programs, we are working with Intelsat, which is one of our programs, um, seeing some actually pretty significant um, impacts there. Actually, just as recently as two weeks ago, we had a, a pretty pretty nice um, demo where we were able to show some, some production uh, uh, cost avoidance using AR. Um, we're looking at, well, most of our work's been on tablet PCs so far um, for a number of reasons, maybe we'll get into that later. Um, we, we, long range, we've been looking at some from um, head-mounted displays, but we're not there yet. But um, we, we partnered with a number of universities and other companies um, to do research um, or to buy software and hardware, um, and we've pieced that together and, and, and um, put that on our shop floor. So. Hi, I'm Mo uh, from BitStars. 
Um, we started to build an AR tracking SDK. We took that SDK to companies and everybody told us we cannot program. We have not so much software engineers. So we created a tool where people can create very easily their own AR experiences. And then we learned that we don't, it's not just about AR. As we saw, it's a lot about 3D content, which should be displayed on tablets, which people can use. And it's more about the content. And we're focusing on that, and we let go the back end side. So we are really focusing on the next, how people interact with it, with gesture, and the, how to create the content without programming. And we have a lot of success at the moment in learning environments, trainings, and yeah. Also in Germany coming up more and more Internet of Things where you display a live machine data around you for uh, the workers. Hi. I'm Frilin, Frilin Wild from the Open University of the UK. The Open University, for those of you who don't know it, is um, the biggest UK-based university. We have about 200,000 students in our for pay program and about a million students now in our spin-out company FutureLearn that offers massive open online courses. It's a big operation with no students on campus. It's a distance university. We have about 5,000 people staff in our main base in Milton Keynes, and um, loads of associate lecturers around it. And we have been doing this for a while. We do mainly professional production of material, professional production of courses, activity plans, and stuff like that. For example, with the BBC and some of the productions we've co-produced, like uh, The Frozen Planet, you've probably seen. In the Open University, I lead a small um, lab called the Performance Augmentation Lab, which is part of the Knowledge Media Institute. And in there, we have the academic liberty to try a few things and mess around, um, not always uh, with success but also sometimes with success and attraction we receive in the three areas um, is, is very much on, on the right-hand side at the moment in the augmented reality and wearable pervasive computing area. We are sort of a gateway in between um, the academic world and the industrial world. We partner a lot um, in research projects with, for example, manufacturing companies. Um, we work with a helicopter producer in Italy, Augusta Westland. We work with textile uh, production companies in Germany, furniture companies in, um, in Spain, and um, several more. But um, we are talking now, um, the now, right? The low-hanging fruits. And from the low-hanging fruits, I think this is a good example of what, what works now easily, and that is the stuff that, um, hmm, how do I get it to play? No, back. It doesn't have a play button. Okay. Um, the stuff. Ah, there is a play button magically. Yep, just press play. The stuff you and we receive traction with today is basically the stuff that provides the wow effect. That is a marketing application such as the one that you should see on screen when somebody presses the play button, please. Um, for example, our Open University prospectus um, that you can download also from the web comes with an R called with an AR app called OU Live. If you open the prospectus and scan the pages on which the big fat AR enabled button is visible, it comes to life and you can see, for example, um, an example we did with our planetary and space sciences. The Rosetta famous um, spacecraft that recently landed on a comet somewhere light years out in space, was flying there for 10 years. You can see it land on your page and you can rotate it and look at it and try to understand where our mass spectrometer that the colleagues from Planetary and Space Sciences produced is actually hidden. Or you go to the environmental science page and see a live volcano explosion on paper. That is the stuff that works today and that is, um, I think, the low-hanging fruit and I'm sure we'll have a few more examples to which we'll come in a little while. I'm Joe Metzger. I work for Johnson Johnson Vision Care Franchise. Um, 
I currently lead a mobility team that's responsible for moving mobility applications out into all of the, uh, the manufacturing facilities within Johnson & Johnson. It's approximately 200 operating companies. Um, you know, we talk a lot about AR, and a lot of it is futuristic stuff, but we've actually started using uh, augmented reality last year, early last year, with a product called um, IQ Agent. We have this in several manufacturing facilities, North America and Europe, and we're looking to deploy it within uh, all the uh, Johnson & Johnson plants. Uh, the one caveat with this application is that it makes it very simplistic to implement it and get to the data and bring it up. It's been very well received. The biggest challenge we've had with this or any type of uh, new technology is our validation process. We're a, uh, uh, obviously heavily regulated with the FDA, DEA, those kind of things. You know, what we make, the products we make either go on your body or in your body. So we, are, we have a very stringent control process that we have in place. Uh, we've been very successful with this product to go through the validation effort with that. And we're also looking at several different uh, other augmented reality type uh, applications to move out within the enterprise. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My name is Jürgen Lomera. I'm um, Global Product Manager for Augmented Reality inside Bosch. And this means we sell solutions, but we also apply it internally at Bosch. So what did we learn in the last couple of years? So we do this in three, four years. We learned we don't sell AR, we, we sell a solution, and internally or externally. AR is just one part of it. You won't substitute an existing solution with AR. You enrich it with AR. And this is the big learning. No AR solution will substitute what you already have because you invested hundreds of, of many years to create content, to create solutions for it, and it needs to enrich where you have weaknesses in your current process. And, and this is an, a learning we have from our customers, but also internally. None of our product um, plans or our internal documentation for our, our products, like white goods or, uh, I don't know, uh, power tools, would allow us to throw out what they already did. They know they have here and here and here a problem, please, improve this, please embed here, please don't change what I already have because the customer knows it, but makes it, makes it seamlessly better. I think that's for us the biggest learning. AR is a perfect tool for it, but we don't sell AR, we sell a solution which helps the end customer. Uh, Jay Kim from Apex Labs. Apex is an independent software vendor that, that makes, our product is called Skylight. And Skylight is an enterprise software platform that's that's unique in, in two different ways. It's cross-device. So within our, our smart glasses sector, we support uh, several smart glasses um, devices that are that are generally available today. And also on the back end side, we also provide scalability and connectivity to a variety of different ERP sources. If you were um, at my earlier talk, which was actually the first talk, and I'm at the last, so thank you for those who, who actually stuck around through it all. Um, I, I talked about this notion of uh, assisted reality rather than augmented reality. Uh, and what that means for us is that we try and integrate using um, our own ecosystem of developers and partners. Uh, we integrate with existing ERP systems where there's, um, there's an existing workflow of data. And a lot of the times that data can be, we'll call it boring, you know, it's not visually compelling. Uh, but there's text, there's diagrams, there's images, and there's workflow data that is tied into the infrastructure that enterprises have invested, you know, years and years of time and millions upon millions of dollars uh, building out. And what we're doing is we're providing connectivity between those systems and using smart glasses where we're delivering that information to, to the person that's doing the work and where exactly the work is being done and doing that in a hands-free fashion. And that, that area specifically by far is where we have seen the the, the most amount of adoption, particularly in the manufacturing, field service, utilities, and energy sectors. Thank you, Jay. So, um, we've got we've got some successes, and uh, but enterprise systems are complex. There's a lot of different players involved, and the question now is, you know, the, will the ROI for project number two, will, 
will it be as great as ROI for project number one? And what will the benchmark be once you've made some success, once you've had some success in your organization or with your customers, will the benchmark be higher next time? Will they actually ask for ROI this time? <laughs> um, so the, my question next to the panelists is, in the near term, with the projects you're engaged in, what are the next steps that you need to take to, to move your projects forward? And I'm talking a little bit about what are the roadblocks right now in the near term? Paul? Um, uh, so let me, there's a couple of different things I'll talk about. First is um, in terms of roadblocks, there's, uh, for us, interfacing, um, you know, AR is a visualization technology. So interfacing that um, with our existing enterprise backend systems, like our PLM systems. Uh, how, how do we, uh, obviously, you know, uh, we, we have a, a whole swath of digital data. Um, in, you know, some of it is CAD models, some of it might be work instructions, uh, processes, whatever. It, it's all sitting out there on our enterprise servers. Uh, how do we plug in this AR visualization component without having to recreate all that content? Uh, I've spoken to um, a number of companies, you know, over the last few years, and a lot of them, are, you know, producing systems and, and software uh, that can do, you know, create an AR experience, and it can guide you on how to do a task, for instance. And the first thing they tell me is, okay, great, now let's sit down and let's author your task in our software. Um, and, you know, that makes me kind of cringe a little bit because we can't, you know, we're not going to reauthor all of our content in one vendor's pr proprietary software. So interfacing, really what we want to do is, is, is to take existing data we have and we'll figure out how to get the maximum value out of that data and present it in a fashion using AR that we, that we get to reap some of the benefits of AR that I actually talked about earlier. Uh, that's a huge challenge. And to complicate that, of course, there are uh, multiple systems even within Boeing that we use to manage and store this data. So it's not like we can you know, create a, an interface to one system for instance, um, a Dassault system and, and have it work across our enterprise because not all of our programs use Dassault-based products. So it's a, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, I would say, um, to continue that point, actually, the way we kind of working, the, the box we're working in now is we're, there's really, there's always, uh, I think all of our pilots have some manual step to them uh, to getting data out of a PLM system or out of a, a program and into our AR tool. And that's really something we have to solve. Um, because to make this truly scalable, uh, we can't be spending labor hours uh, on converting data or creating new data or, or processing existing data. We really need that to be automated. Um, the second point I would touch on is the cultural issue. And that's, that's a barrier for us at the moment also. Um, getting our mechanics and our technicians comfortable with, with this type of technology. Um, you know, for folks in this this conference and this uh, field, you know, what what we're doing in Boeing, we probably consider to be pretty basic in terms of ARs or handheld form factor tablets, cell phones, things like that. We're not looking. Well, we are looking, but we're not implementing any any head mounted or eyeglasses at the moment. Um, I just think there there's too many cultural barriers there. Um, part of this is going to be you know a generational shift. Waiting, you know, the next generation of workers that comes through will obviously be more expecting this type of technology. Uh, whereas, um, uh, you know, some of our workforce now are, 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 are not comfortable with it. Um, so so th I think I'll leave it there for now. Th those are the two big, big um, roadblocks what I'm seeing at the moment. Um, our customers wish to have glasses. So they are they're used to use the tablets, it's great, but the hands-free experience, or if they want to make the next step, for them is really important to see working glasses and have them. This is really an issue which is stopping that people go and scale it or take it to their managers and say, okay, this is something new, we can get a budget, and we can go with the variables. And I think in the past two years, a lot of things changed. So that a lot of the back-end integration is coming, that we have companies who make device management, uh, or it's like APX, making the connection back to the back end. So a lot of things are coming together and everybody is now ecosystem. This is what, what the good thing is happening is that we're creating an ecosystem where everybody is now willing to work with each other. So one thing is solved and the next thing is, yeah, just waiting for the glasses. Yeah, 
Yeah, just so my answer is uh, the standard academic answer. So it's uh, it depends, um, and I think uh, there are two interesting factors that we should look at um, of how we can increase the traction of augmented reality in the world, and that has to do with this mountain we see there on the left hand side. There's two ways of how we can make this mountain of users higher, um, either by making the peak higher or by trying to cause a tectonic plate shift that raises the ground level. Um, funnily enough, um, the way user acceptance is built is different in the peak to the tectonic shift. In the peak, where you have a few apps that have a lot of users, um, this world is governed by things like technology acceptance. It's governed by a lot of factors that have nothing to do with hardware, software. They have more to do with organizational culture, with support instruments, and many things like that. In the long tail, however, it's completely different. That is a world that is governed by principles such as opportunistic design, meaning we don't need standard software, we need standardized components that we can remix, mash up, glue together. We need open technology um, that allows us to quickly create an application for a use case that serves only a handful of users, or a few more than that. Um, in these two different worlds, we need to do different things to increase traction. And um, if you would switch to the next slide. Yeah, you can see in the in the peak. If we look at um, information system studies such as technology acceptance model three, um, there are a lot of factors that go beyond the direct um, effort, expectancy, performance gains, uh, performance gains, um, expected uh, per perceived ease of use. But there are factors that have, for example, to do with do users see this as playful? Do they like the engagement with the software? Um, do other people in an enterprise use it? Do they have the support instruments? Does it map one-to-one -to, -one to their job descriptions and so on? So that is something um, that we have to do in, in that area. And. Um, um, that is an example here of one of the applications we developed which had a very high playfulness factor and a vi very high um, ease of use. That is um, an application that um, allows for telementoring, where basically um, an instructor sees what the user sees through the camera, and a system of ghost hands is mapped into the field of view that is remote operated just based on the video instruction. People like doing that. It is uh, very um, easy to use. People get it completely. It has a certain wow effect. But um, it is completely different to um, the stuff that we need to do in converting millions of pages of existing technical documentation. And that's now the, the long tail end of content and users where you have um, the description of, for example, a maintenance operation for which you need an open standard to express it in a way that you can pick up um, the real world and the interaction with the real world and navigate the user through it. And that is one of the initiatives we're doing to make this easier. It's um, an IEEE standards working group that kicked off on beginning this month, to which I kindly invite all of you, um, in which we're trying to take that to the next level so that we can create workflow descriptions such as the one um, which you will also find on, on my website a video of where a user is taken through a maintenance procedure, a setup procedure of um, a textiles weaving mill. Well, there's basically two challenges that uh, we faced or did face. Um, technology and the uh, and a business. Technology is already stated as the uh, getting to the data. If you think about it in a manufacturing environment, you've got your high level systems, your ERP, your mid-level MES, and your bottom layer SCADA. And each one of those layers present their own challenges. You know, whether you use ODBC or OPC to get to the data, the one recommendation that I would make for the industry is that when you develop these products, to have the type of interfaces that are readily available to make the interface to those things very simplistic, because that really is a big barrier. The other piece is just um, the business case. It's like, 
we've got a tool here, and sometimes you're looking for a solution. Uh, it's new, it's, it's cool, um, but you know, where is the ROI? And sometimes it's difficult to actually be able to convince business you know, w there is ROI in here, you know, because it's a technology that hasn't been used before. So that's somewhat of a challenge. Okay, um, I think Bosch solved what you described as a problem, Paul. We m can mass create the data. We can connect to um, PLM system and really produce as many variants as we want by an author. But this exactly causes now a problem because suddenly, you can roll out these things and the people start believing, oh, so far it was a far away distance idea in my R&D department. And now it's coming close to me, I can use it. But is, does this mean anybody else can now do that work? Because AR shows even an untrained people how to operate something. So is this social aspect or the acceptance of a new technology or the f uh, being afraid that I lose my job because there's a new technology. Before it was far away, this was not industrialized. I think this has changed now. We see this internally, we see this with our customer. They accept we can now roll it out for all of their products. But at the same time, the employer's council coming and say, okay, you record with a camera something here. They find suddenly reasons why this is technically possible, affordable, but we don't want it for reasons they make up, being afraid they're losing their jobs. And I think that's at the moment a big problem. We'll all see this sooner or later. When you get over the humble that you have not just a sandbox project, when you say I can do it for all of my products, for all markets, for all variants I produce. One easy way of driving a, a higher second turn ROI obviously is to, to cut back on the cost of the implementation of the, the second use case. So I'll, I'll present it as the Minimizing unnecessary um, integration costs or professional services costs, whether or not it's in content creation or recertifying your, your applications for within the, the corporate IT environments and what have you, um, you know, that's, that's in a, a relatively low-hanging fruit with um, the right mix of solutions, hardware, software, and services uh, to be able to make sure that not even within your, your own enterprise, but even between um, industries and then uh, within verticals to, to be able to attain some, some repeatability across the different kinds of implementations so that um, services dollars that a lot of the customers are spending are, are being directed towards um, you know, the, the rifle customizations and connections to, to data sources and creation of content um, as necessary. And then of course on the flip side of that is if you're cutting back on your initial integration cost, um, you obviously want to be in a position, that, that's upfront, right? Whether or not you deploy with 50 users or 200 users or a couple thousand users, um, a lot of that services integration cost is uh, incurred upfront as a capex. So being able to, to drive down some of your opex by um, hitting a, a higher user count on a per user basis, that's obviously got uh, a lot to do with selecting the right kinds of use cases and um, availability of compelling hardware, compelling user experience, what have you. Yeah. So thank you. So the next thing I wanna bring up is that every company has to make strategic choices. And now that you've had a little bit of success, there are other opportunities. That success opens doors. So some choices have to be made. So you have to ask questions like, are we gonna continue to develop things inside or in-house? Are we gonna go out? Are we going to use proprietary solutions that get us somewhere quickly or are we gonna make that extra effort to go with standards. So the next question I wanna ask the group is midterm. What are your next strategic choices that you're considering right now? Paul? Um, well, I think you touched on some of the big ones there. Um, that's always a question that we ask ourselves for any new technology. It, it, uh, do we buy it or do we make it? Um, the answer varies. With, with augmented reality, the, the pilots that I mentioned earlier, that, that was using a system that we developed in-house. When we started doing this, probably, um, well, actually, Boeing did its first AR back in like 1980-something, which was um, you know um, way back a little different. 
But you know, more recently, we've been getting serious about using it on the shop floor, maybe for four or five years, and even as recently as like five years ago. If you looked in the in the market for you know a, a company or people with experience or who could sell you something for an enterprise industrial uh, use case of AR for you know for work instructions or task guidance, you wouldn't find anything. Now there we're starting to see some companies and some some more content there, but back then there was nothing. So we actually took. Um, uh, we were working with Diffusion from Total Immersion, and we, uh, which was really an entertainment-focused uh, SDK, and we took that and we built around it, and we developed our own AR system. Um, uh, um, uh, and we, we do tracking with infrared cameras, which really hardly anyone was doing back then, uh, because most of it, again, was for entertainment, where you can use markers or other, other you know, um, posters or things like that for tracking. When you're in a factory, you know, your parts, you don't want to put these things necessarily on your assembly, so we, we created an interface to a tracking system. We really built it all ourselves. Um, but going forward, of course, I mean, we don't, we're not in the market of developing and, um, and selling augmented reality technology. Um, uh, my group's work has really been to explore the concept and to communicate the ideas, to get um, you know to get the thought thought processes flowing with the executives and and going forward we'll probably be partnering more with um, providers of the technology. Of course, they'll do a much better job than we will of impl of, of creating these AR systems. You know they have whole teams of, of people working on these things. Um, we're really excited about things like the uh, Microsoft releasing the Hololens. Um, I think there's a lot of potential there, and so I think that's going to be our, our our plan going forward. Um, to touch on the second point. Um, we are interested, obviously, in creating standards, um, and, and we're actually doing a number of things to support that. Um, I just recently signed up for an OASIS, um, Augmented Reality for Technical Communications Standards Group, and we're going to be um, um, exploring what we can do there to help standardize so that we, we make parts more interoperable and, and interchangeable, which, of course, will benefit everybody. So, you know, a uh, company our size is always interested in, in helping the, in the community and the industry um, to further itself with standards, so we're, we do participate in that kind of stuff. Um, I'll start with the standards. I think um, standards are good to have, but we will see probably things coming up which will be great successes and those things will be the standard. So there will be some software, maybe, I don't know, from HoloLens, if it gets a market reach from 90% and everything which runs on a HoloLens is the standard then. So it's good to put a lot of work into it, but we have to see where it will go. Um, and as said before, I think partnering is a good thing. So we are outsourcing, we don't do hardware. We are re yeah, thinking that hardware and backend should be done by other peoples. But what we do, um, which was also a great idea, to stay and make tracking systems by our own. So we have our own tracking systems. And as we've seen, for example, as Metaya was bought last week or two weeks ago by Apple, a lot of people who were yeah, reliable on technology for Metaio have now a problem or they have to switch or to rewrite a lot of stuff. And this was a good decision to be one of the companies to have their own tracking solutions back then and very early. I, l let me answer that question um, with the restriction to the manufacturing sector. I think it's a little bit easier for me to answer that. Um, I think in manufacturing, when you're producing goods, when you're producing, for example, technical goods, products, anything the like, there are some areas you definitely will not ever offshore or outsource, and that is, of course, the stuff that has to do with product design, right? If you would hand out your product design 3D modeling process um, to anyone else, that, that would be dangerous to your, to your bottom line, to your core business. However, um, the adaptation of AR technology, that is something where quite certainly people like partnering up with the best in the field um, and um, where the adaptation of the content to augmented reality devices is of course done in partnership very often. It, yeah, I, I think pretty much hands on your content, um, but the software development um, is cheaper in many cases if you work with other people. It always depends on what scale you do that, but 
um, especially when you get started. Um, that's out of the question to do major investments in that area. The question about standards, um, I think um, if you can pretty much guess my take on that. I think there are way too few standards in that area, especially that help with the reuse of content, which is one of the major problems we're still facing in the industry, that there is a, a lot of content out there on the web, on intranets, um, in PLM system, in ERP systems, um, which could be used to very quickly produce um, augmented reality experiences, could be used to bring handbooks alive in gazillions of cases, but um, we're, we're not yet there, and we, we have to try to make moves. This is not about the one-off authoring or uh, training instructional designers within companies. This is about conversion of loads of bulk content, binding the action step descriptions of maintenance instructions, assembly instructions, um, setup instructions to the actual product models that exist often only in the isometric perspective depicted in product brochures, uh, but never has been rendered in any other way or not even to speak of rendering down the 3D models so they can really be played on a portable device or can still be downloaded from the web and do not have to be prepackaged. There's still a lot of work to be done in that area, but it's, it's a good time to get started with it. Uh, our core competency is healthcare products, and we'll stick with that. So we're going to leave it to the experts and purchase our augmented reality uh, applications on the, uh, on the market. For standards, as an end user, we'd like to contribute to that, which is one reason why we joined the area organization. Um, and I, I have a two minded answer. Of course, on one side, we develop a product and we buy for the product when it makes commercially sense components from the outside. A product we're selling, an AR product, and we buy components. We don't build all of them. But on the other side, we are a service supplier. We have 600 authors worldwide who are doing exactly what you just said they should not do. Uh, giving us their CAD data, we do animations with it, or they sit at the customer. So this is a process or a, a, a business model which is already existing to outsource the content creation. I mean, in the future, in my opinion, there is no need anymore for programming an AR application. You publish, you describe in an XML document what the application should do, you publish it, and the client understands it. So the software developers will be back-end developers and you buy a card part of a product and you fill in content by yourself or by a third party, preferable us, of course. But uh, there is not a, a one or the other. It's both. So um, propriety is a standard, but I'm a German. I have to, by nature, be for standards. So this is, <laughs> I cannot argue against this. Uh, but I think there are already a lot of standards. When Bosch relies on standards, we, we would not be so successful in automotive if there would not be standards we can work towards to because then you can deliver quality. Then you can exchange data with other suppliers because it's naive to think a, a single company is the only supplier for a given even an AR solution. There will always multiple. The purchasing departments demands this and therefore you need standards to be part of that. It only works for a very short time that's proprietary and you occupy that space very quickly. This is a standard and you exchange to have a, a, a market and, and to compete with each other. So we are really uh, fully into that standard. But we also believe there are existing standards. Where we're coming out of technical documentation. There are standards how to define certain um, things in a certain way for learning management system, for technical documentation in automotive. When you, you find hundreds of, of uh, DTD or schemas which are already existent. Uh, in my opinion, we need to adjust it. It's a AR is not a new animal. AR is a variant of it. So we have to live in what is already there and adjust it or, or extend the existing ones. In an industry that's still somewhat very, um, it's very nascent, uh, a lot of the standards, to be honest, are, are being defined as we speak um, by the existing legacy players. Uh, so if integration with ERPs and PLMs and other kinds of systems is a uh, a requirement in your deployment of augmented reality, then the reality is that you're going to have to to program against, and I'm speaking, of course, purely within the, the software construct, um, you're, you're going to have to bind to whatever their programming model 
that there is. And in many of those cases, using guys like SAP and Oracle, for example, um, there is a you know there is a a, a very large swath of um, developers that are well versed in those kinds of things. And frankly, it's their business to to do that that integration. Uh, that itself presents a, a challenge on the proprietary versus the standard. But um, I would argue that if a proprietary programming method, for example, is a, a well understood um, method within a, a community of developers, then there is a path potentially for some of that to, to come closer towards the, the standard level. Ideally, from uh, our perspective and certainly from the, the user perspective, there is standardization across different data interfaces and, and content creation methods. Frankly, I think we're, we're a little ways away from that. But you know, by being able to, to drive some of the standards that are, um, that are pre-existing as de facto standards, um, programming models of really large companies and leveraging as much of that as possible is one thing. The other thing is um, as new, new folks are coming into the space, um, equally as important to try and, um, try and utilize different programming models and tool sets that are well understood to the, the broader programming world and making sure that you're not, you're not creating a silo um, by going off kilter. Um, you know, that, that of course is very, very important. Uh, take Unity, for example. Unity was, a few years ago, uh, kind of, you know, gaming type of an engine. Still largely is today, but if you're looking at different kinds of glasses that are coming out there, Unity is being mentioned as the engine of choice uh, that is getting integrated to, to do a lot of the visualization. Um, you know, and from, as an area member who's been working with a lot of these guys over the course of the last year plus, uh, we would love for some of those guys to, to come on board and start talking about uh, standardization as well. So, thank you. So, uh, moving on to the, the far term and the long term, I want to give you guys another opportunity to, to talk about what you see as the, the big roadblocks to expanding AR adoption one more time with a, with a broad look ahead before we get to our optimism of the future. Paul? Um, I think um, for us, partly, it's the scale of what we do. <laughs> Um, there, you know, there, there. I forget the number. There are multiple millions of parts and, and processes that go into building an airplane, and and getting um, getting AR technology to a place where it can cope with all that and it's effective, and we're putting it in the right place at the right time. Um, it just is mind-boggling to me. Um, uh, so it, you know, the complexity of what we build, the scale of what we do, the size of the company, the number of employees uh, that are, we're we're, work, we're talking about. And just the, you know the sheer scale of the, what we're trying to change, we're trying to we're trying to cause a paradigm shift in the way we deliver work instructions uh, in a company our size is is just a huge undertaking. So th you know, uh, I, I do believe we're going to get there. Um, I hope it's within my career, but um, sometimes I wonder. Um, I did want to um, uh, when we talk about um, I want to make a comment that um, was mentioned earlier. You know, we, there are some. Um, uh, you know, there is some pushback a little bit. You know, when people don't want to lose their jobs, they see this new technology coming in. Uh, they're, 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 they, they, they think it could replace people. So I always, you know, I actually make a conscious effort to communicate to the program leadership that we're really not trying to uh, uh, eliminate people. We're trying to improve the efficiency of those people. So we want to keep the same workforce, but we want to be able to build more airplanes with the same workforce rather than have to reduce, you know, rather than be able to reduce the workforce. So that that really resonates with folks. I think. Um, uh, I think it's you know when when you when you're asking for help developing a technology that's ultimately going to put somebody out of a job, you're, you're going to have an uphill battle. But really, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to we're trying to build more airplanes um, and, and be more efficient in what we do. So. I think it's also important for the consumer side that there will be a change, so that's not just for the workers, so that people have it in their free time, spare time using augmented reality or virtual reality to get used to work with 3D content, this will be a huge change. So if you work with kids who are used to you work with Minecraft, you have no problems to give them something with AR, they understand it, they understand the whole future of it. And parents who have kids who were 
play with Minecraft, often get it also much faster. So this mass consumerization of 3D content, and not just AR, everything with, e with VR, AR, there will be a real mix. And I think with the name of HoloLens and Holo, it's a great thing because it yeah, goes away from these two different kinds and yeah, makes it much more clear of Holo and people get it more for more understanding. And if somebody has seen Star Trek, they will be, oh, it's cool. Yeah, I think also work if you talk to them, oh, you will be in Star Trek, it's much cooler than to say, oh, where is AR glasses? So this is the shift in the whole society, also like it was with mobile phones. This is a thing which will come maybe in the next five years. So we heard this at this conference a couple of times, this uh, paper from some co colleagues in Oxford. Um, our is, is the job of the future taken over by robots um, uh, called Fry and Osborne? And um, I, I disagree with their assessment a little bit that there is a danger of jobs being taken over by robots. And if you switch to the next slide. No. Um, okay. The root cause of this change is actually just a change in the industry, in manufacturing this change of job profiles just comes from the industry shifting and shifting services to the left and the right. If you look at this smile diagram that you see in front of you, the 1970s line, um, the money made, the value added um, in production was still mainly in production. Today that has changed a lot and um, the curve has changed to the to the blue one, where before and after services are much more important, where product design is much more important, where research and development is much more important, that on the left side, or where after sales services, um, providing training programs, doing marketing the right way, those things have tremendously increased. So that is the root cause of why the job profiles are shifting and um, the instrument for that truly in production was to have advanced machinery and many jobs are now that previously were manual done by robots um, so my answer to the question what has to happen in the long term and what are the obstacles is if we look at those areas there's only on the right hand side a lot that is happening with support of augmented reality and that is still largely in marketing the stuff that has the wow effect there is more and more stuff in after-sales support, and we're seriously talking, I think, across the board here with the industrial partners we work with, or are, about doing a lot more, a substantial investment into AR, converting whole product descriptions, um, and so on, not just the one-off. Um, but on the, on the other side of the spectrum, I don't see that much happening. There is not so much design R&D support with augmented reality, and there surely could be more. So the, the biggest challenge, I'll go back to what I said earlier, is getting to still getting to the data. We, we know how to validate things, we know how to deploy them, we know how to train people, we know how to go ahead and make the business case. It's just getting to the data. Like last year when we deployed our, our first AR application in the manufacturing environment, once we realized we developed, once we realized how to get to the data, it was a very quick process from getting that application up and running and getting it out to the manufacturing facility. So if we can get to the data, we'll go ahead and deploy it. Um, I think there are two challenges. They, they arise from the fact that we believe we, we really can solve the problem with mass data. But now I have a lot of data, but the devices are not able to hold all of the data or display it because now I'm rendering a whole um, um, jet fighter. So I want to, to, to lay out everything. Uh, show me glasses who can render or do anything this size, or even a tablet, when I have not just one uh, part of it, I show the whole airplane or a car with multiple components in it. So the scalability is there but on the software, but the hardware doesn't support it because nobody had the need to build these things because there were not enough data there. That's one thing. Uh, for me, a roadblock. The other thing is currently we see a lot of managers, decision managers, who act 
is everybody is in their age. They don't see the new people coming and, and would like to use this technology. So they make decisions with the assumptions everybody is like them. And, and these, these managers need to change. They need to see, and they only change when they see a killer application. And this is what the whole market, the whole industry is looking. A killer application where you go out and everybody says, wow, this is no longer a game. This is no longer a fancy marketing application. This is something where somebody saved two million euros within one year. Or I, I could even build a product so complex because I have used AR and I was able to do it in all languages, for all countries, et cetera, et cetera. This is missing to convince these managers. For us, these are the two roadblocks to make it totally successful. And, and maybe in two, three years, we're here and have everything full, not just maybe 50%. Echoing uh, an earlier remark that I made on repeatability, I think as a as a technology provider in the space, uh, we certainly share the burden with other kinds of providers and integrators um, of reducing or optimizing the the total cost of ownership uh, of these kinds of solutions, uh, whether or not it's an AR solution or um, something that's a, a little bit lower tech than that. Um, being able to reduce the total cost of ownership by having as much um, repeatability. Uh, across the different kinds of use cases is, is important. So say that a large customer goes and makes that initial investment into your first AR solution. The upfront cost associated with that is going to be significantly larger um, because you have to do things like enterprise IT, security compliance, and content creation, and so on and so forth. So for your subsequent use cases, um, from an adoption perspective and from a buyer perspective, there has to be some initial you know, return on investment associated with the money that you've already put into it so that you're not reinvesting everything all over again. Um, echoing what I think a lot of people said, uh, hardware still has to be, um, there is no one size fits all device and wearable devices by, by, by nature are, are highly personalized, highly custom, intimate devices. Uh, and there is a right tool for the right job and there, there is not going to be um, one size that fits all. HoloLens is awesome um, and you know, having having tried it myself, it is it is mind blowing, um, but it's not going to be the device that that scales across all of the different use cases. So having a, a diverse set of um, devices, balancing wearability, comfort, um, connectivity, and capability, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a big industry wide, I think, barrier to adoption. Thank you, and I know we're running a little bit long, but I want to get the, our panelists to answer one more question, and this has to do with um, the future. Uh, just a little bit of prediction and or guesstimating about what the future brings, what you think or you hope. Um, so, you know, there could be some paradigm shifts. There could be cultural shifts. Um, so, please, Tell us, what do you think? I love these predicting the future questions, uh, it's, uh, especially when it's being recorded. Um, you know, um, I, I think I, I am an optimist about the future. I think when you take away all the small technical, in the big picture, I would say small technical details of, you know, um, uh, the technology, you know, we talked about uh, capabilities of tablets and, and smart glasses to render. You know, that will come with time, just, you know, everything, you know, computing hardware gets better. Everyone knows that over time. But I think the I, I, I'm, I'm excited about what's going to happen because you know when you look at how people have interacted with with information or how they've retrieved information uh, pre augmented reality, there's always some uh, some medium in which you have to go to or use to get the information you want, whether it be work instructions or whatever you're trying to do. Um, you know, if, if to, to get something off the internet, you have to you have to have a cell phone or a tablet. You have to go to a, a a portal that takes you from the real world to the digital world, so you can retrieve that information. And that is inherently inefficient. Um, you're limited to the capabilities of that portal. It's it's usually a 2D device, and you can only do so much with it. When we look at what augmented reality really is, is it's 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 placing is taking the digital information out of the digital world and placing it in the real world. It's merging that digital uh, uh, realm with our actual livable space. And I don't even uh, think we've started to understand what that means. I think 
um, you know, um, we've all talked about the, the efficiency gains and things like that, but I, I, I truly believe even, even the folks at this conference probably have a lot to learn about what that truly means, and I think it's going to be bigger than any of us um, uh, anticipate. Again, I think with Apple bringing some new AR devices out, also in the tablet, with the Prime Sense, everybody gets used to that devices. And even parents will see, the workers who are afraid about their jobs, that their kids will have the hard toy, and they are toy they have paid twice now, and it's not reducing cost they are. It's driving, it will be the same with their jobs, so it's not going away. So there will be a lot of learning in that area that people learn with the mass consumption of 3D content. And this is, I think, the near future. And we are just really looking on one corner with the companies and industry side, how we make it. And they will, I think the content will change really again with more and more capabilities, with machines, if the machines don't have their own manuals with them and robots, a new kinds of manufacturing which is coming now with smart factories. There will be a lot of change and we are not looking just to get the manual down to the tablet. This is the, I think, the 1.0 AR stuff. And we will see soon moving to AR.2.0. The good thing about predicting the future is that you're always wrong, right? Um, so even if you predicted it correctly, no one will acknowledge it because it's then a commodity and no one notices. So having said that, <laughs> I can safely say anything I want. Um, I, I think um, it, it will be pretty much a commodity. And the devices we see coming out, um, especially also in the consumer segment, predict a very interesting future and um, a day in the office puts a completely new label on uh, or impression on the word killer application right um, if we if we think about that um, there is so one area that um, I find very exciting and that I haven't seen that many things yet and that has to do with the combination of 3d printing and AR with using kind of printable totems to bring the real world, the materiality, the haptics of it to life, so that we interact with something we can touch, but that is then just a canvas of projecting augmented reality experiences on it. So that's, that's an area in which I think we will see a lot of innovation in the near future, and maybe in the long-term future. This will all go away and we will not notice it because it was successful. I have no idea what the future is going to bring, but I do know this. We as a company need to be involved in this technology. Um, if you think about it, the iPad is, what, five and a half years old? I mean, it seems like it's been out there for a whole lot longer, but it's a relatively new device. Uh, two and a half years ago, you're hard-pressed to find an iPad on a manufacturing floor. Today, they're everywhere. We use them uh, with, our, with our IQ agent application to bring up documents and, and make annotation and look at production numbers and in ways that we didn't dream of in the beginning. Um, it just sitting here at this conference, you know, I've, I've been thinking in the back of my mind of different use cases that we're going to be able to use this kind of technology. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty excited about it. All I know is that I kind of not afford not to be involved in this. Uh, I see a future where you cannot sell your product anymore without providing an AR help for it. If, if the consumer understands how good a support this is. I don't buy a printer anymore, which is not telling me how I changed this stupid uh, car printer cartridge. I don't buy a TV anymore. It's not explaining me where what button I have to put. So the, the future will be that the customer demands, I want to get AR. I want to get it. I don't buy your product when I have it. They don't know that they want AR, but they want this feature which makes the usage of that product simple. And you can transfer this easily also to industrial product. I can only be efficient or a technician who has maybe used in his training session an AR aid set. I don't work like that in my uh, plant anymore. I learned it via AR. Give it me, then I can be efficient. So the, the way AR will be distribute or will be introduced will suddenly change from 
a technology or a, a department who drives rolling it out to a customer demanding it, and the customer being the end user of a product, or a technician in a workshop, or a training manager, and, and, and. That's what we believe will be th the future. I think uh, smart glasses in, in particular are going to follow the, the adoption cycle that's akin to the personal computer, uh, as well as um, smartphones. If you think about the personal computer, oftentimes it was a notion that was actually introduced at the workplace same thing with smartphones. I mean, now we liken them to iPhone and Android and Windows phone devices, but originally uh, smartphone adoption really took off in the workplace uh, with BlackBerry leading the charge. And certainly we, we see that in the, in the future, smartphones uh, following that curve where a lot of that initial adoption and a lot of the initial encounter um, by users of this technology is going to actually happen at the workplace and you know, eventually move it down into the day and home. Obviously, glasses are going to have to get much, much better at that. And then consistent with that concept, um, smart glasses and maybe more broadly, um, wearable technology devices like smart watches and other kinds of things are going to be um, the, the principal interface that people are using to, um, to access this whole industry 4.0 construct of the industrial internet of things. <laughs> well, this concludes the session. I'm sorry we don't have much time for questions. We've already run late. I want to thank our panelists, if we can give them a hand.